Welcome to part 15 of this video on the immune system. Okay, so we're currently in the process of discussing T-cell production. And the point that we've got to now is that the thymus gland is putting into the bloodstream these mature, naive T-cells. And these are now the finished product. These are now ready to actually be activated by uh, antigen-presenting cells. And we've discussed that um, we are producing these two different types of mature, naive T-cells, the CD4-positive T-cells, which are the helper T-cells, and which are going to be activated by antigen fragments that are presented in the context of MHC class 2, and remember that will be extracellular pathogens, and the CD8-positive T-cells, which are the cytotoxic T-cells, they're part of the cell-mediated adaptive immune response, and they're going to be activated by... Uh, peptide fragments presented on MHC class 1 protein complexes, and of course that will come from intracellular pathogens. Okay, uh, so we're putting these mature, naive T-cells into the bloodstream, and remember they're all going to have different T-cell receptors, and none of them should have a T-cell receptor that is going to recognize a self-peptide fragment presented on either MHC class 1 or MHC class 2. We should have got rid of all of those. So the only mature naive T-cells that are being put into the bloodstream should have that T-cell receptor that isn't capable of being activated by a MHC complex with a self-peptide fragment. If it can be activated by anything, it should only be an MHC complex with a non-self or pathogenic antigen fragment. Okay, so uh, what are we now going to discuss? Well, we're going to discuss what happens to the mature, naive T cells next. So they've gone into the bloodstream from the thymus gland through the high endothelial venules. Where are they going to go next? Well, what happens is they continuously move around in the body. They do not just go to one site and sit there forevermore. They circulate around. They go into a lymph node, then they'll move via the lymphatic system to another lymph node, and then eventually they'll drain through the lymphatic system back into the bloodstream, and then from the bloodstream they'll go to a different lymph node. So they're continually circulating between the circulatory system and the lymphatic system, and it's this concept that I want to now discuss with you. And I think actually for this I'll just get a fresh piece of paper, because I want to draw some large pictures that probably won't fit on that little space that we've got left there. Okay, so the first thing that I want to do is discuss the lymphatic system, and what is really the purpose of the lymphatic system. So remember the lymphatic system consists of lots of little lymphatic vessels which are draining tissue all over the body. So tissues all over the body have lymphatic vessels draining them, and they are just draining tissue fluid from the tissue. So all areas of the body have lymphatic vessels draining tissue fluid from that area. Now what actually happens? Where do those lymphatic vessels actually lead? Well lymphatic vessels gradually all converge up, so they build larger and larger lymphatic vessels, and those lymphatic vessels will, those larger lymphatic vessels will then drain into structures known as lymph nodes. Now what is the purpose of lymph nodes? Well, lymph nodes take part in a process known as immune surveillance. They are absolutely full of lymphocytes, hence why lymphocytes are actually called lymphocytes. They are the cells of lymph nodes, they reside in lymph nodes. And the principle of a lymph node is that the fluid, known as the lymph, which is coming into the lymph node, has to percolate through all of the lymphocytes of that lymph node in order to drain to the lymphatic vessel which drains the lymph node. Okay, And the idea is then that all of that fluid is being filtered and surveyed by these cells of the adaptive immune response. They are continuously on the lookout for the presence of something nasty in the tissue fluid that is coming to them. So, let me make this more clear by actually drawing you a picture of a, a lymph node. Okay, so here then is a picture of a lymph node. So we're going to have lots of 
lymphatic vessels draining into the lymph node, which I'm drawing here, like so. So these are the lymphatic vessels that are all draining into the lymph node, like so. So the fancy word for these is that they are the afferent lymphatic vessels. So these are the afferent lymphatic vessels. Afferent just means coming into. So these are the vessels that are coming into the lymph node. So I'll just colour these in, in red here. And as I say, these were the formed from loads of tiny little lymphatic vessels which drain the tissue uh, converging together. So each of these is a reasonably big lymphatic vessel or a lymph vessel. It doesn't matter, it means the same thing. Uh, and they were formed from loads of tiny lymphatic vessels. So let me just show this. So here, here are three smaller lymphatic vessels joining together to make this larger one and each of these, I'll just show it for one, would be made by even smaller lymphatic vessels and each of these would be made by even smaller lymphatic vessels and maybe this level of lymphatic vessel actually drains the tissue so the tissue fluid will enter in from here so this is tissue fluid entering into this lymphatic vessel and as I say, all tissues all over the body, they're being drained by lymphatic vessels which will go into lymph nodes, and you have lymph nodes all over the body as well. So you don't just have one lymph node. And the fluid then that's inside lymph nodes, uh, sorry, the fluid then that's inside lymphatic vessels is then called lymph. So once the tissue fluid goes into the lymphatic system, it's then called lymph. Okay, right, so the fluid that's draining from these tissues into the lymph node via the afferent lymph vessels is now going to have to filter through the lymph node. So now let me show you the structure of uh, the lymph node here, but just before I go any further, let me tell you that there's also one lymphatic vessel that's coming out of the lymph node, draining the lymph node. So all of these afferent lymphatic vessels, they are draining into the lymph node, there is one lymphatic vessel draining out, which is the efferent lymph vessel. So efferent means coming out. So it's the lymphatic vessel that comes out of the lymph node. So efferent lymph vessel. And I'll just colour this one in, in blue here. So overall, we have a huge number of afferent lymph vessels coming in, and they're draining their lymph into the lymph node. And then we've got one bigger lymph vessel coming out of the lymph node. Now what we want to look at is what's in between, the actual lymph node here. So let me show you the structure of this. So firstly, the absolute outer portion of the lymph node is made up by a capsule, just like the thymus gland had a capsule, lymph vessels, all, sorry, lymph nodes also have a capsule. So again, uh, my favourite colour to show capsules is green, so I'll just colour its capsule also in green. So this is the capsule of the lymph node here. And then inside, just inside of the capsule of the lymph node, you're going to have a sinus where all of the lymph that is coming into the lymph node from the afferent lymph vessels is going to drain into. So I'll draw this like so. So a small sinus just underneath the capsule, a small space effectively, which is where all of this lymph is going to come into. So all of the fluid coming in through these afferent lymphatic vessels is going to drain into this space that I'm now colouring in in red here. Okay, and that space is known as the marginal sinus. So margin is the outer portion, so marginal sinus makes sense. Okay, so there's the marginal sinus. Now, underneath the marginal sinus, in this space here, is where all of the lymphocytes are going to be sitting. Now, before I just discuss that, let me discuss that right at the centre of the lymph node is going to be another sinus, which is where the lymph that is going to drain into the efferent lymph vessel here is going to accumulate. And this is now called the medullary sinus. So medulla means the centre, so medullary sinus at the centre of the lymph node, again, makes complete sense. So, here's the um, overall picture of how this is going to work. We are bringing in lymph, which is going to be coming into the marginal sinus of the lymph node. In order for the lymph to then go into the efferent lymph vessel, 
it has to get to the medullary sinus. Now, in order to pass from here to here, from the marginal sinus to the medullary sinus, it has to pass through this great big thick layer of hundreds, thousands, probably millions of lymphocytes. And this now is the concept of immune surveillance. So that fluid that is coming from tissues from a huge number of areas potentially because you know these afferent lymph vessels they could have overall been built from tiny lymph vessels that were coming from a great variety you know a great amount of different tissues okay all of this fluid is now going to be scanned it's going to be surveyed by these lymphocytes it's going to have to go near the lymphocytes and if there's anything nasty in that fluid it's potentially going to activate those lymphocytes and therefore activate the adaptive immune system. So truly, the lymph nodes are performing an immune surveillance function. They're on the lookout for nasty things that are coming in to them in this, from these afferent lymph vessels um, that is present in the tissue fluid. And if they find it, they're going to launch adaptive immune responses. So they're absolutely key structures uh, in the activation of the adaptive immune response. Okay, so let's now study this layer of lymphocytes in a bit more detail. So this layer of lymphocytes is divided up into two separate layers. The cortex, which is the outer portion, so to add on a label, this portion is going to be known as the cortex, and then the portion that's underneath here, which isn't called the medulla, instead it's called the paracortex, so it's parallel to the cortex. Now, what's the difference between these two areas? In the cortex, you have B cells and T cells, whereas in the paracortex, you just have T cells. So, in the paracortex, you're going to have loads and loads of T cells, and this is one of the places where these mature, naive T cells that we're producing of both the CD4 and CD8 type can hang out, and indeed they don't separate, they interdisperse, so you'll have an array of different, you know, an array of T cells, and you'll have CD8 and CD4 uh, positive T cells integrated together. The B cells, however, they do segregate themselves from the T cells, and they are in specific structures in the cortis, cortex of the lymph node, known as B cell follicles. So there are these spheres known as follicles which contain the B cells. So I'll just colour these in here and we'll have them coloured in I think in not green, uh, we'll use yellow. So here these are representing the B cell follicles and these are just spheres within the cortex where there are loads and loads of B cells. Now I know we haven't discussed B cells yet. Um, all I'm saying at the moment is a very simple concept that these are just the regions where B lymphocytes, which we will study in a huge amount of detail later on, are going to be present. So those yellow structures are known as B cell follicles. And surrounding the B cell follicles will be loads and loads of T cells. So in all of this space in between the B cell follicles, this will be inhabited by T cells. Okay, right, so those are the B cell follicles. Just to complete this picture up then, I'm just going to colour in all of this uh, in between space in an orange to demonstrate that this is where you're going to have loads of T cells. So in all of this space in both the cortex and the paracortex you've got loads and loads of T cells. Right, okay so these are the lymph nodes. Now um, we're going to discuss the fact that the mature naive T cells that we've produced are going to come out of the bloodstream and go into lymph nodes in a moment, but first I just want to discuss more about the lymphatic system. I want to discuss where this efferent lymph vessel is now going to go. So the way the lymphatic system works is that you go up, there's a hierarchy, you, you're gradually forming bigger and bigger lymphatic vessels. So this efferent lymphatic vessel, it might fuse with a few more efferent lymphatic vessels, and then it might converge with other large lymphatic vessels uh, to, f in, to enter another lymph node. So there are multiple stages of this. So let's just draw a simple picture here. So let's 
say that this dot here represents the lymph node and that these lines coming in here represent the afferent lymphatic vessels and then let's say this is the efferent lymphatic vessel coming out of that lymph node. What might now happen is that you might have another one of these over here, so let's say this is also a lymph node and we've got all of these afferent lymphatic vessels draining into this lymph node and here is its efferent lymphatic vessel. So I'll just colour these all in. So these in orange are the efferent lymphatic vessels. And let's say that we've got a third one here. So here again is another lymph node. Here are the afferent lymphatic vessels. And then let's say again this one is the efferent lymphatic vessel. And now all of these might come together in a higher up lymph node here. So another lymph node here. I.e. there'll be another pass through. So here's another lymph node. And these are now the afferent lymph vessels for this next lymph node and then there will be an efferent lymphatic vessel coming from this and it might go for another lymph node and what gradually happens is the lymph is draining into bigger and bigger lymphatic vessels and eventually what happens is all of the lymphatic vessels of the body drain into two massive great lymphatic vessels which are the thoracic duct which is the biggest and then also the right lymphatic duct. So let me just discuss a little bit of anatomy with you. These massive great lymphatic vessels are then going to drain into the venous system. So what I firstly want to just draw is the major veins of the body on the superior portion. So I want to draw the superior vena cava, the two brachiocephalic veins, etc. Uh, and show where the thoracic duct and the right lymphatic duct are going to drain into uh, those veins. Okay, so firstly just the major veins then. So let's say that this is the superior vena cava and it will drain into the right atrium which will be here. In fact, I might just draw that on. So here's the right atrium of the heart. This is the superior vena cava. Now, the superior vena cava is formed by two great veins joining together, which are the two brachiocephalic veins. So I'll draw these here now. So we've got the left brachiocephalic vein on this side, and we've got the right brachiocephalic vein on this side. And just to orient you, we're looking from the front. So this will be the left, and this will be the right. So this is the left brachiocephalic vein. Okay, right. Now, the two brachiocephalic veins on either side, they are also made by two veins, two great veins joining together. So the two great veins that join together to make each of the brachiocephalic veins are the internal jugular vein and the subclavian vein. So this one here will be draining the uh, left arm here, and I'll just draw it equivalently on the other side like so, so it's nicely symmetrical. So again, this is the right subclavian vein, and this will be draining the right arm, the, or the right upper limb more correctly. So this is the left subclavian here, draining the upper limb. Uh, and this other great vein that's joined here, this is the internal jugular vein on both sides. So this is the left internal jugular vein, this is the right internal jugular vein. So this is the left internal jugular vein. Okay, so I'll colour this all in in blue because it's all veins. Okay, so I hope you understand what I've drawn here. This is the major venous system in the superior part of the chest. Um, and it's the great veins joining together to form the superior vena cava. And this is actually where these huge lymphatic vessels are now going to drain into the venous system. So, the two great lymphatic vessels that all other lymphatic vessels eventually drain into. So all lymph is eventually going to drain into these two great vessels after it's been through however many lymph nodes. Uh, these are the thoracic duct, which is the greater of the two, the bigger. So the thoracic duct. And then also what's known as the right, and I'm just putting R for right as I put L here for left, uh, and also the right lymphatic duct. Okay, so the way this works is the right lymphatic duct is effectively the equivalent of the thoracic duct on the right-hand side for the very top part of the body. 
You see, for most of the body, for most of the trunk, the thoracic duct is in the midline and it uh, drains the lymphatic vessels on both sides of the body. So let me just show this. So what will happen is the thoracic duct will be behind all of this. So imagine what I'm drawing is behind all of this. And for the most part, it ascends in front of the vertebral column, just in front of the vertebral column, and it's ascending in the midline. So it ascends in the midline like so. And it will be draining lymphatic vessels from both sides of the body. So lymphatic vessels will be coming in from both sides of the body. So the thoracic duct is effectively doing both sides of the body. But then towards the top what happens is the thoracic duct deviates to the left hand side like so and then is going to drain into the left subclavian vein like so just before it fuses with the left internal jugular vein to form the left brachiocephalic vein. Okay, just like I've drawn here. And I hope this is showing up with the uh, low light levels. This is a this highlight is running out as well, so I'll just go over these lines a bit more so that you can hopefully see them better. Okay, now in this region up here where the thoracic duct is deviated to the left hand side, no longer will it be draining lymphatic vessels from both sides of the body. It'll now just be draining them from the left side of the body. So what we now have in this superior portion of the trunk is we have another great lymphatic vessel to do the job of the thoracic duct but on the right side of the body and this is the right lymphatic duct which I'm now drawing here so it has this sort of position and again it goes upwards like so and will drain into the right subclavian vein here just before it fuses with the right internal jugular vein so this will be draining lymphatic vessels from the right upper portion of the trunk like so. So these are the two great lymphatic vessels then that all other lymphatic vessels are eventually going to drain into. So all lymph drains into one of these two after having gone through lots of lymph nodes and participating in the immune surveillance procedure and then it's going to drain into the venous system. So why am I going through all of this? Well I want you to have a good understanding of the lymphatic system and the reason I want you to have a good understanding of this is to understand how lymphocytes are going to circulate between the lymphatic system and the cardiovascular system. So you have to understand that the lymphatic system eventually drains back into the venous portion of the cardiovascular system. So let me now give you then the complete picture of this circulation of lymphocytes, T lymphocytes at the moment, but the same thing is actually going to happen for B lymphocytes, but we'll come on to that when we come on to it. For now we'll just focus on T lymphocytes. So I want to show you the circulation of T lymphocytes between the cardiovascular system and the lymphatic system. So I'm going to draw another picture and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw the cardiovascular system schematically here. So I'm going to draw a physiologist's diagram for the cardiovascular system, a very simple picture of the cardiovascular system. So I'm draw drawing a few tubes, which is always a good start when drawing the cardiovascular system. And now I'm drawing a box to represent the heart. So this is going to represent the heart. So it's a very simple picture of the heart, and the box is representing the heart. Um, and this side, this tube here, is going to represent the entire venous system. And now I need to draw the arterial system here, like so. Okay, and then what we're going to have is the microvasculature in between the arterial system and the venous system. So we'll have some arterioles and some venules and then capillaries in between the two. So these are going to represent the capillaries here like so. Let me just connect this up to finish this picture. Okay, so let me just explain this picture then now. So here's the heart. This is representing the arterial system. So all of this bit here in red, this is representing the arterial system. So the aorta and the other massive great arteries of the body, they're all being represented by this tube here. So this is the arterial system. And then this portion here in blue, this is being this is representing the venous system. 
Okay, so this is representing all of the great veins, so the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, the brachiocephalic veins, all of those massive great veins that you learn the names of in anatomy. Okay, so the basic model then of the cardiovascular system is that the heart moves uh, blood from the venous system to the arterial system, and it does so approximately every 0 0.8 seconds if we're working with a heartbeat of around 75 beats per minute. So it moves a bucket load of blood from the venous side to the arterial side. Okay, that raises the pressure in the arterial system compared to the venous system. Indeed, arterial blood pressure is far higher than the pressure in the venous system. That creates a pressure differential between the arterial system and the venous system, which then creates the drive for blood to flow through the microvasculature, which is represented by this portion of the picture here. So this is the microvasculature, represented in yellow here. Okay, so this is representing a little arteriole, and you can imagine it's a terminal arteriole, maybe. These are the capillaries, and here is a venule. Okay, so the lymphocytes that we have produced so far in the thymus gland, they are going to go into the cardiovascular system initially. What I now want to discuss is how do they then leave the cardiovascular system and go into lymph nodes? Well, in the lymph nodes are special venules, actually, that are, again, high endothelial venules, which can allow um, lymphocytes to move out of the bloodstream and into the lymph node. And that's what I want to now add on to this picture. So let's say now that this microvasculature here is within our lymph nodes. I'm going to draw uh, a lymph node here. And it will be a bit out of scale, but never mind. So this is going to represent my lymph node like so, and here is the efferent lymphatic vessel coming out, and of course there will be loads of afferent lymphatic vessels coming in as well, so here's another afferent lymphatic vessel, here is an afferent lymphatic vessel, here is an afferent lymphatic vessel. Okay, so here's some microvasculature then within my lymph node here, and it's these venules, the venules of the lymph node are very special and are known as high endothelial venules. And to show this, I'm just going to give them some high endothelial cells there. So usually, remember, endothelial cells are squamous. These ones are going to be very tall endothelial cells, as indeed I'm drawing here. So I'll colour these in. So here's the basement membrane, and that's representing our high endothelial venule. So what's now going to happen is these um, lymphocytes that are currently in the bloodstream, these mature, naive T cells that we're producing, they can go around the bloodstream and they might just end up in the microvasculature in one of the lymph nodes. There, the high endothelial venules will recruit them from the bloodstream into the cortex and the paracortex of the lymph node. So that's how lymphocytes are going to end up inside the cortex or the paracortex of our lymph nodes. So let's say that this is one of my um, mature naive T cells here. So I'll just colour this in in red here. Okay, brilliant. Now what's going to happen is this lymphocyte here, this mature naive T cell, and I'll just label him up there. So this is a mature naive T cell. It doesn't just remain within the lymph lymph node that it's gone into forever. Instead what happens is it gradually moves out of this lymph node and the way that it's going to get out is it's gradually going to move down the cortex and the paracortex towards the medullary sinus here at the centre of the lymph node. So it moves towards the medullary sinus and then it will pass into the medullary the sinus and of course the medullary sinus contains lymph that's going to drain out through the, through the efferent lymph vessel here. So what's now going to happen is that my mature naive T cell that's spent a bit of time in the uh, cortex and the paracortex of this lymph node here is then going to leave this lymph node and it will go into the medullary sinus then out through the efferent lymphatic vessel here and then of course it will probably end up in another lymph node. So it will probably come, coming back up to this picture, into the marginal sinus of some second lymph node that the efferent lymphatic vessel has drained into, and then it will 
also now have to make its way through the cortex and the paracortex of this lymph node. So it will then spend a lot of time in the cortex and the paracortex of this lymph node. And there it will be doing a job of immune surveillance. So every lymph node that it sits in for some time, it will be performing this role of immune surveillance. And then gradually it will work its way out of this lymph node as well. So it will end up in the medullary sinus. It will shoot off through that efferent lymphatic vessel. And it will go through lymph node and lymph node and lymph node after lymph node. And where will it eventually drain into? Well, I've given you the answer. It will eventually drain into one of these great lymphatic vessels, either the thoracic duct or the right lymphatic duct, and therefore it will drain into the venous system, so it will be back in the cardiovascular system. So eventually what will happen is this will drain into the lymphatic system, as shown via one of these great lymphatic vessels that I have uh, discussed with you and therefore the T cell, the mature naive T cell will just circulate through the lymphatic system back into the cardiovascular system then it will spend a little bit of time in the cardiovascular system until eventually it will go through the microvasculature of one of the lymph nodes and then it will get recruited back into that lymph node uh, and then it will move through the lymphatic system again back into the cardiovascular system. The point that I want to emphasize here is that these mature naive T cells do not just pick a lymph node and sit in that lymph node forevermore. They are continuously moving from one lymph node to another lymph node to another lymph node, going into the cardiovascular system, going to a lymph node that might drain a completely different portion of the body. They are moving all over the point place. And that's important because we need our different T cells to go all over the place. Because remember, the different T cells are capable of launching an adaptive immune response against different pathogens. Different path you know, pathogens might infect us all over the body in different tissues all over the body. And the different tissues, their lymph, the lymph that's coming from them, is going to drain through different lymph nodes. Okay, they'll drain for a different part of the lymphatic system. So we need to make sure that our T cells are continuously moving between the different lymph nodes to make sure that we're continuously mushing it up effectively, rejigging everything to make sure that there is the continual opportunity for the right T cell to be in the right place to actually see the right antigen fragments and launch an adaptive immune response to that pathogen that's infecting a certain tissue. So it's very important that we're continuously reordering everything and moving these T lymphocytes around. Okay, and this is what's known as the recirculation of T cells. So I've just described the recirculation process. Okay, right, so we've now almost completed our prerequisite discussion of T lymphocytes. We have discussed the production of T lymphocytes in a child where the thymus gland is present. We've also discussed once you've actually produced T lymphocytes, where do they actually go and what's their life like? What is their daily activities, i.e. this recirculation process? Just a few more points that I want to note before we have a break. The first thing I want to talk about is what's the lifespan of a T lymphocyte? And I think I'll go up here now to write. So what's the lifespan of a T lymphocyte? How long do these things live? Well, the first thing to say is they don't live in this form for the lifetime of the human, okay? Memory T lymphocytes, which we'll come on to later, they have a much longer lifespan and they can actually live for the lifespan of the human. However, these mature, naive T cells, which have never been activated so far, they haven't seen their antigen fragment yet, they will not live for your entire lifetime. Instead, they have a lifespan that is between months and years. So their lifespan is months to maybe up to a year or beyond. So that sort of figure is the lifespan of T lymphocytes, and then they'll be removed from the bloodstream. Okay, so that's the first thing that I want to say. The second thing that that now motivates is the question of, oh, so the thymus gland, we know that this involutes after puberty. So in children, you have a beautiful thymus gland which is producing T cells in the way that I have just described to you. 
After puberty, the thymus gland starts to become smaller and smaller and smaller, and the fancy word for this is involution. It starts to involute. It gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and is gradually replaced by fat tissue, which is certainly not capable of performing the role of producing new T cells. Uh, so, by um, adulthood, the thymus gland is almost completely gone, and certainly by you know, the time you've reached your 40s, it will have completely been replaced by fat tissue and will no longer be performing this role of producing new T cells. So the question now becomes, but we've said that the lifespan of T lymphocytes is only up to a year or maybe a little bit beyond that. What happens? Will all our T lymphocytes suddenly disappear and we won't be able to produce more? Well, they don't. So what actually happens to maintain the population of T cells? Well, currently, the theory that most people believe, although it is still controversial and some people argue for different mechanisms, but the main answer that people mainly believe is that a level of homeostatic proliferation maintains our T cell population. So let me explain what I mean by this. So we believe that after the thymus gland has involuted, your T cell population is maintained by homeostatic proliferation. And what this means is that the naive, mature T cells that you've got in your body at present, they are capable of dividing, okay, at a very slow rate. And we believe that's the way that you maintain your T-cell population after the thymus gland has gone. So when you're a child, you'll be producing loads of new T-cells and you'll continuously be making new T-cells that have a different design of T-cell receptor. The idea is that after the thymus gland has involuted, your thymus gland, by the time that it's involuted, has produced a huge number of different T-cells with very different T-cell receptors. So we've got a great range of different T-cells. We don't now need to produce any new T cells with a new design of T cell receptor. We've got a huge plethora of different T cells with different T cell receptors. So what we can now do is once the thymus gland is gone, we can just get them to divide at a really slow rate so that they make copies of each other. And that will maintain our T cell population and it will also maintain the diversity in the T cell population. So once that T cell, uh, well, once a specific T cell gets old and then is going to be removed from the bloodstream, the idea is that it will have produced a few little copies of itself and those will replace it. And that's believed to be the way that we maintain our T-cell population after the thymus gland has involuted. And that concept is known as homeostatic proliferation. Okay, so just before we finish this video, what I want to do is just introduce a little bit of terminology that's a very important piece of terminology uh, because I'll be using it in the future. The concept of a, t well, not a, sorry, get rid of that. The concept of a T cell clone, not a T cell receptor clone, although you could probably use the term T cell receptor clone, but the concept of a T cell clone is what I want to introduce you to. So the concept of a T cell clone is all of the cells, all of the T cells that have identical T cell receptors. So I've just said that the T cells, they are capable of this homeostatic proliferation, this very slow proliferation, and they'll produce identical copies of themselves. And those identical copies, they will have the identical VDJ recombined alpha locus and beta chain locus. Okay, so the DNA doesn't suddenly go back to the germline form when they divide. No, it remains the same. So their progeny will have that same uh, altered alpha chain locus and that same altered beta chain locus, i.e. they will use the same identical design of alpha chain and beta chain. That means that we'll produce a little population of T cells that all have an identical T cell receptor. We say that all of those T cells are of the same T cell clone because they all have identical genomes and they all express on the surface identical T cell receptors. So this concept of T cell clones is very important and I'll be using it uh, in the future. Okay, so just to use the term T cell clone to get you used to actually hearing it, homeostatic proliferation of the T cells maintains the T cell clones 
in the uh, body uh, as for the adaptive immune response, i.e. Uh, even though we're not producing any new T-cell clones, because of homeostatic proliferation we won't be losing any T-cell clones, we'll still have the same diversity of T-cell receptors if we were to look um, at our entire population of T-cells, even after the thymus gland is involuted. So homeostatic proliferation overall maintains the diversity of T-cell clones. Okay, so we'll have a break here, and in the next video we'll actually go back to the story of the adaptive immune response. That was our great big um, side bit of information about T lymphocytes and where they come from, and the real reason that I wanted to do this discussion in this huge amount of detail is to discuss exactly how um, they all have, well, all of these different T cell clones have different T cell receptors which will be capable of being activated by different major histocompatibility complexes with different peptide fragments. What we will now do is go back to the actual story of the adaptive immune response and we'll see how the antigen-presenting cells are going to activate T cells.